On behalf of my husband, Mayor Kasim Reed, and the entire great city of Atlanta, I welcome you all this evening to tonight's evening of critical conversations. Now we are living in a world where more than ever, conversations, sometimes uncomfortable conversations, are needed more than ever. The city of Atlanta does not take lightly its role and responsibility in ensuring that women are leading and forcing change. Recently, the city appointed our second ever female police chief. We recently announced the anti-displacement fund so that residents, often women heads of households and single moms, are not displaced from their homes on the west side, displaced from communities that they helped build. And lastly, the, the city's women's Lastly, I'll mention the city's Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative, where the city of Atlanta takes women entre entrepreneurs and provides free office space and access to technology so that women entrepreneurs can grow their business. Women play a vital role in ensuring that critical conversations take place, but not only take place, but lead to consensus building and changing of mindsets so that we can change some of our age old systems of inequities. The city of Atlanta is a partner in ensuring that women continue to bridge divides. Thank you to the King Center for always hosting such powerful conversations. Let's have an awesome evening and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the First Lady of Ebenezer Baptist Church Mrs. Olie Ndoye Warnock. Hello, welcome. Welcome all to the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church, America's Freedom Church. Every Sunday here at Ebenezer, we say our motto together. And we say, Ebenezer Baptist Church is an urban-based, global ministry dedicated to individual growth and social transformation through living in the message and carrying out the mission of Jesus Christ. Dr. King was doing just that. He was carrying out the mission of Jesus Christ. As he and other civil rights activists led the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, a day that we celebrate and honor today. These causes are championed by so many dedicated foot soldiers, activists, and other crusaders for justice that are gathered here in this sanctuary today. This is the work of social transformation, and it is the work that we honored Dr. King for this morning when his statue was unveiled at the Georgia State Capitol. As Dr. Bernice King reminded us this morning, this was the work that, doc, that Mrs. Coretta Scott King dedicated her life to so that we would all remember the work of her husband, the late Dr. Martin Luther King. So we honor her as well. When Bill Clinton spoke of Mrs. King, he said, when her husband was taken from her, she carried on his efforts to bring America together, not knowing whether her struggle would succeed, but sure that it was too important not to try. In other words, she persisted. <laughs> And so, as we look back and honor history, I'm so glad that we will also look ahead and see what we can do in this moment. I'm honored to welcome so many of you here today, so many great women who understand the importance in this moment of persisting. Welcome to Ebenezer. Thank you. Please welcome our moderator, the youngest daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mrs. Coretta Scott King, and the CEO of the King Center, Dr. Bernice A. King.
Oh, good evening, everybody. We are so delighted that you're here tonight um, to join us in this very important dialogue and conversation. And I must say this at the beginning, just to break a little bit of the ice. We've got ourselves in a hell of a mess. <laughs> Yes, we do. But there's not anything that this nation faces that we, especially women, cannot handle. We will be that persistent presence and that persistent voice in the struggle for freedom, justice, and equality for as long as it takes. And so I want to welcome you tonight uh, to our beloved community talks, Let's Bridge the Racial Divide Across Urban, Suburban, and Rural America. Today, as many of you know, is a very famous day. Uh, some 62 years ago, um, a young teenager lost his life senselessly for allegedly whist whistling at a white woman. But I say he lost his life for just being black, and at that time, Negro. Emmett Till was murdered on this day some 62 years ago. Some 54 years ago, as was already uh, mentioned by Mrs. Warnock, my father delivered his famous prophetic speech, I Have a Dream, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And now, because of that, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners on this day witness the unveiling of a statute on the grounds of our state capitol here in Georgia. And that does deserve a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we cannot forget some fifth, some Is it nine? I think that's right. Some nine years ago today, an African-American senator from the state of Illinois accepted the nomination to be the Democratic candidate for the president of these United States, Barack Hussein Obama. Yes. And so today is a special moment, and as we gather, we're going to make history because each one of those events created a shift in our nation. And I believe tonight's conversation is going to do that. It's going to shift our conscience. Uh, we have purposely brought together divergent voices because with the current polarization and tension in our nation, it's time that we get up close and get personal and have discussions that may be a little bit uncomfortable but necessary for us to come up, find a common way forward because as my father reminded us in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos of Community, he said that we must learn to live together as brothers and I add sisters or together we will be forced to perish as fools. And so tonight we're gonna learn we're going to peel back uh, the onion, and um, we're going to do it in a civil way. We're going to show uh, this nation and this world how to have these courageous, necessary conversations. But we recognize that conversations are just the beginning. But as Dad said, people 
hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they are not communicating with each other. And they don't communicate with each other because they're not connected. And so tonight we're going to be connected and we're going to be communicating so that we can begin to know each other so that we can do away with the fear and, and alleviate and eliminate hate in our society. Because hate cannot win. Only, as Dr. King taught us, only love prevails. And ladies, as my mother said, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, I believe you must become its soul. And so again, welcome. And uh, we appreciate all of you being here tonight. We're going to have a few conversations. Uh, and I want to say to everyone in the audience, there's going to be an opportunity for some questions. We won't be able to get to all of the questions. Uh, but as we ask those questions, let's just remember uh, the spirit of uh, the, the, the nonviolence that my father left with us, which we call nonviolence 365, uh, because it's a lifestyle, and that our goal and objective is not to win over people in our dialogue and conversation, but it's to win people over. That is the spirit of nonviolence, because we seek to defeat injustice and not people. And so welcome again, and I am going to turn it over to the voice of God. And now we'll welcome senior Democratic Senator of Massachusetts, Miss Elizabeth Warren. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. You know, you seem so far away from me. I know. Can we I'm wondering how we can get a you little know, bit I can closer. Move a little furniture here. I can make this happen. You know, ladies can do a lot of things. That's exactly right. When you when you when you don't like something, then change it. That's right. All right. There That's we go. what we do. This is how we do it. Yeah. That's right. So we have some women here with us today, but Boy, this is also do. this is also on Facebook Live, Twitter. Uh, is also carrying it and, and it's being streamed live. So there are a lot of people that are um, listening in on our conversation today. But let me start first by just thanking you for your courageous leadership. Um, when, I, when, when I turned on the television and saw that you were trying to um, introduce my mother's letter on the floor of the Senate. My heart was just so overwhelmed. Um, it's been 11 years since my mother um, left us. And I've been just hoping and praying that she would once again emerge in some kind of way. And so I want to thank you for letting her voice uh, be heard in these times, in these difficult times. Um, and for persisting in the midst of all of that. Uh, but, but I want to I wanna ask a, a very in, important uh, question. One, first of all, how did you handle the persecution um, and the humiliation of that moment? Because so, many, so often as we as women and as individuals uh, are challenged with taking a stand, speaking up, standing up, it does take courage. But it also comes with some persecution. So how, how did you handle that? Well, it, so let me just start by saying how honored I am to be here with you and to be here in the center that your mother built. Uh, the night that I was told to sit down and be quiet because I was trying to read your mother's letter uh, on the floor of the United States Senate, I never knew that I would get a chance to read her letter, not on the Senate floor, but on, just to do it live stream and introduce that letter once again to millions of people across this country. You know, at that moment, all I could think about is this isn't about me. This is about a message 
of justice that the Senate Republicans at that moment just didn't want to hear. They just didn't want to hear it. And they thought the way you could not hear it was to make me sit down and be quiet. And it is the reminder that they got that exactly wrong. When you try to suppress, That's when right. you try to push down, when you try to silence, mm -hmm. then that just makes us all that much louder. And that's what happened with your mother's letter. That's how yes, I see yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. So, obviously, th this is a time that's calling for courageous leaders, um, desperately. I think people are looking for guidance. Mm -hmm. and, and I want you to just provide us some insight as to what elected officials, in particular, uh, female uh, elected officials, uh, political leaders. What examples of courage can they provide in this current climate? So I think that, that women in particular have something special to bring to the table. Mm. And that's because women pretty much do whatever it takes necessary to get it done. And that's, that's kind of that's kind of been our job since the time we've been little, right? Is you get in there and do what needs to be done. And in the case right now of change in this country, you know, I, I watched this unfold, for example, over health care. Mm -hmm. as, as this country debated whether or not to roll back health care coverage for 25 million Americans, whether to raise the cost of health insurance for millions more. And our side of the aisle didn't want to do that but we didn't have the votes to stop it. And the way, the way it was stopped was by the voices of people all across this country who made themselves heard. In fact, can I ask, how many of you tweeted about health care or posted about health care or sent an email about health care, or made a phone call about health care, or showed up for a rally about health care, or a protest, or at someone's office. That was how we made change in this country. That is how we made the voice of the people heard. That's what gives us strength. So tonight, we, we're, we're talking about bridging this racial divide. Mm -hmm. um, racism is very contentious. Yeah. And, um, uh, sometimes we try to avoid it, mm -hmm. um, and I believe that we have to confront it head on. Um, many times people see racism as really impacting only black and brown people. Um, but my father reminded us of the interrelatedness of life when he said we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, and what affects one directly affects all indirectly. And he went on to say, I can't be all that I ought be until you are all that you ought be, and you can't be all that you ought be until I am all that I ought be. With that said, how do you believe racism impacts all of us? And how do we get, in particular, the white community in general to understand that? So, I think one way is because it, that it impacts all of us is that it divides us. It turns us against each other. And your father spoke to this as well. Because when we turn on each other, then that means we're not facing the problems that are our mutual problems. You know, right now in America, we have an economy that works for those at the top, and it's not working for anyone else. Can I, can I do numbers for just a second? Sure. Okay, good. Because um, this, is, this is actually this, this is something really important to talk about. You look at an America, we, we were a boom and bust economy, the big one hits in the Great Depression, and Franklin Roosevelt says, we can do better than this. We can do better. And so America starts making more investments in the future, makes more investments in education, more investments in infrastructure, more investments in basic research. And what happens? GDP goes up, but here's the key. The 90% of America gets 70% of all the new income growth in the country. 
And it hits across a broad range, upper middle class, middle class, working class, working poor, and poor poor. Everybody is getting more. Now, it's not perfect by any stretch. The black-white wealth gap was there from the time we first started measuring in the 1940s. But the civil rights movement led by your father, starting in 1965, just in 1980, just a 15-year period there, the black-white wealth gap, when we passed the civil rights laws, when we invested in economic opportunity for more Americans, it shrunk by 30%. Mm -hmm. in, just, in just 15 years. So think about that. We weren't in the right place, but we were on a path. And then you watch things change about 1980. Ronald Reagan gets elected, trickle down economics, deregulate Wall Street and big banks, and cut taxes for those at the top. And what's the consequence of that? We start spending less on education, hmm. less on basic infrastructure, less on research, the things that help build a vibrant economy. And here's what happens. The, the GDP continues to go up. That's the good news. GDP goes up in both periods. But the 90% of America, the group that got 70% of all the income growth in that first time period, from 1980 to 2016, the 90% of America has gotten almost zero new income growth. Nearly a hundred percent of new income growth in this country has gone to the top 10 percent. And the black-white wealth gap has tripled in that period of time. Now, in an America where you can turn black against white, when you can say, oh, race issues are over there, something else we don't want to have to talk about, no one focuses on and addresses the economic issues that are affecting all of America, and that's what it is we need to focus on. So I, I want to, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you went there because I, I want to push you a little bit further on that. Okay. My, my father said uh, that racial injustice or economic injustice and racial injustice yes. are perennial allies. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you feel that really fuels or feeds uh, the current racial division in this, this nation? Because we don't talk about that enough, that's I right. think. I, I think when, that's exactly right. And you know, I was um, uh, so pleased. I was asked last year in 2016 to address the Democratic National Convention. And I quoted your father mm -hmm. on exactly this point to argue to help America succeed, to help people succeed, it's going to take bringing us together, not dividing us. So long as we stay divided, then this economy will continue to work for a thin slice at the top, and everyone else will be left behind. That's how I see this. So I'm going to ask you a question. Sure. Because there's a lot of division and polarization, especially in Washington. There is. Um, when President Obama was in the White House, there were many people who didn't like him. Mm -hmm. And they fought against everything that he was everything trying to do was in favor. from day one. Mm -hmm. I think and it now, was actually before day one. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I that, really did. That, that's true. I think it was from the moment he got elected. That, that's true. They said, not that, not that. And right. it continues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now, and now uh, President Trump is in, in the White House, and obviously there are those who don't like him, and they're fighting everything and resisting everything that he's trying to do. What is my point? I guess I'm concerned because I see some tension here that exists that if we're not careful, we're going to keep doing these extremes back and forth, and it's, I believe it's going to harm America. So what is the, what is the solution to stop that back and forth, the, well, we resist, and we resist, and we resist, and we resist. How do we find a common way forward so that America overall can move forward? Because we are caught in the midst yep. of... So, so let me start with, with the government part of this, okay. because that's, cause that's my job right now, is to think a lot about what we do with government. And for me, it really is this fundamental question that I was just talking about. It's who do you think government works for? If you think supposed government... supposed to be for the people. Well, it's supposed the to people. be for the people. But let's face it, 
Washington is a place that works great now. If you can hire an army of lobbyists, if you can hire an army of lawyers, if you're a giant corporation, if you're a billionaire, and this is how it works. Every decision that gets made in Washington, there's somebody in the room to represent the rich folks. There's somebody in the room to represent the giant corporations. And in every decision to make the argument that maybe you could just, just change that decision just a little bit, just to just make sure the guys that I'm getting paid to be here for get, get just a little bit more. And you do that over and over and over, and you end up with a government that really has been seized by those at the top and who keep making it work for themselves. So for me, the test is not about Democrat versus Republican. It's not about one president versus another. So much as it's about whose interests are you trying to advance. Remember, one of the very first things that President Barack Obama did is he got out there and fought for health care for millions of people across this country. You know, and there are those who wanted to do it one way or a different way, but the point is we knew what he was aiming for. He was aiming to make sure that everybody in this country has access to health care and that we bring down the cost of health care for all of us. To me, that shouldn't be political. That shouldn't be partisan. That shouldn't be one president versus another. That is a leader a leader who is saying that this is what is right for human beings in this country, for people, for all of us. So, so how, how, how do we, because I, I definitely hear you, how do we really find a win-win in this very diverse nation that we, we live in? You know, I, I try to, as much as possible, <laughs> mm -hmm. I try to follow my, my father's uh, philosophy and methodology, which is a win-win philosophy and methodology. And it really is trying to bring divergent interests together and looking at how do we find that, that common ground so that we can really move forward. So is that even possible in Washington? And then is it possible in America? So I think it means... Or is it, is it invariable that people are just going to be left behind? No, I can't. And left out. I can't out. accept that. Okay. I, I can't accept that. So I, I think of it this way, and, and you'll permit me because of where we are, to talk about... I, I, used, I was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So can we talk about Matthew 25 for just a minute here? Sure. Because I, I think it's actually relevant here. You know the story, of course, of, of uh, uh, the sheep and the goats mm. being divided, right? And in effect, the Lord deciding who's going to heaven and who's not going to heaven. It's, it's the parable that Jesus tells. And good to be a sheep, not good to be a goat, you know, where this, this story is headed. And, and the sheep ask the Lord, so why us? Why, why did we get picked as sheep? And he goes through the list of the things you did. Uh, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you ministered to me, right? He, he goes through the long list. And the sheep say, but we never saw you. We didn't do this. And, and Jesus says, inasmuch as ye have done this unto one of these, the least of thy brethren, ye have done it unto me. And the way I, I hear that is that he's saying to us first, there's God in every one of us. There's Jesus in every one of us. There's however you see it in your religion, but that, that inside there's something holy in every single person. And the second thing he's saying is, and I call on you to act, not to sit back and proclaim your faith, but to get up and to make a difference. And the third thing I hear him saying 
is, and it is every one of you. When the final day comes that every one of you will be judged by what you did for the God in others, I think that's the place we start this conversation. That there's God in all of us, and we must die. That's how I see it. Yeah, uh, I think we call that the, the Imago Dei. Yes. The, the image of God um, and that divine spark. Jesus also said something else that I've been wrestling with lately. Um, he said, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. He did. He did. He did. But it gets even better. He said, bless them that curse you. Mm -hmm. Most times we skip over and say, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And we forget one of the most important parts that says, do good to them mm -hmm. that hate you. Mm -hmm. For those of us who are Christians, mm -hmm. it's a commandment. How do we do good to those that hate us? Because that's where we are today. There's a lot of hate in this society right now. How do we do good to the folk that really hate us because I'm convinced that it's very difficult to protest hate. The mm -hmm. only thing that conquers hate is love. Um, so, I know I'm getting in trouble for this question and I'm standing by it. In the spirit of Christ and in the teachings of Dr. King, I think we're in that moment of doing good to them that hate us because I believe there's a transformation in that. I mean, my father constantly did good to those that hated him. The deranged woman who, she was deranged and hated him and stabbed him. And she, he was more concerned about her well-being than he was about the knife at his aorta that if he had sneezed, he would have bled to death. The gentleman who came up and socked him and he refused to sock him back and he stood there and was concerned about that man how can people in this season of all this hate learn to do good to those that hate us that's a holy hush because <laughs> that's where we're being called to i believe in the midst of all of this um, and it's a tough scripture. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a tough scripture, but notice, it's not a scripture about being passive. Exactly. It's not a scripture that says lay back and just let hate roll on through. Right. It's not that. It's a scripture that says do good. It's a scripture that says act. It is a scripture that says make your love strong. It is a scripture that says to me, raise your voice. Make sure you are heard. That's how I hear that scripture. Okay. Not in anger, not in anger, but make your voice and, and, heard and that, in strength and for what is right key. and what is holy. And that's the key. You just said it. Not right. in anger. Not in anger. And that's but, what we have to work on. But in determination. Righteous indignation. But in determination. Yes. yes. And yes. righteous indignation. All right, I'm going to open it up for anyone who has any questions. Um, I think we have just a few minutes. If you come to the mics that are, are there mics there? I'm right over here. Okay. Yeah, so There's I had some questions. There's a lady here um, that wants to ask a question. Is there okay. a mic nearby? Um, so I think the question that you asked is really powerful, Dr. Uh, Bernice. How do we love in the face of hate? And I hear you, Elizabeth, when you say, speak up, speak up, speak up. But in my opinion, as uh, someone who's been in communication and actually studied your father for many years, 
Uh, there was a lot of training and development in terms of how to do that. And I think it starts with understanding human behavior, especially our own, first. With all this talking, I don't, I'm concerned about there being any real listening. Is there any listening? So how do you balance that of, you know, protest, protest, resist, no. speak, 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 but how do we create a culture where we're actually hearing one another, where we're listening? Because I can't think of a greater act of love than being able to hear. But that's not how our society works now. It's all post, like, media, brief, you know, rapid responses. How do we balance that? Look, there is a lot of that. I, I get that. But, but I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to disagree with you a little bit. I think there is a lot of listening that goes on. But I think that listening comes from strength. I think that when you know where you are in your own heart, when you know what you're fighting for, that it makes it a lot easier to take a deep breath and hear what someone else has to say. But I want to be strong on this point because I, I really feel that this is right. I think we are called on to listen, but then to respond. And, and that it has to work both ways. I'm, I'm all for it. But we can hear when we know why we speak out. I think that's, I think that's the heart of it. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you for holding this um, conversation. Oh, thank, thank Dr. Yes. King. She's thank, the one. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank the, you. The whole community and, um, you know, this might sound a little naive. I'm 62, so I was like 10 years old and 65. I remember a lot of the marches and civil rights movement. And I've been saying recently that wouldn't it be wonderful if we all did what was done back during those marches where people dressed up, looked respectful, went arm in arm, black and white, and just showed a strength that is based on love. Back then, people joined arm in arm. And the fact that they, you know, I mean, it was a respectful thing. I think that's powerful. The conversations, you know, there's so much social media that the human element has really, as you said, kind of been removed. But when we get together in community and we, we share, you know what, you, food brings people together. Have a great meal, form individual community <laughs> gatherings and have those marches where everyone's dressed up and they're arm in arm, the blacks and the whites, because you know, it can be done. I know we went through a long period where racism didn't seem to be as prevalent as it is within the last, oh, I'd say 20 can, years Can I more. get you to get to the question because we got to keep moving, you know, I'm sorry. I don't really have a question. Oh, was, okay, it's, well. It's simply, I, I, it's simply I, I, a we suggestion. Got, we, okay, we, Start at the community we, level and work out. Okay, thank you, we appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. And thank you for Dodd-Frank. Thank you. This will, this will have to be our last question because we have other Hello, uh, conversations um, and some of our conversations are going to have to leave to catch the yes. plane. So. Hello, Dr. King. Uh, my name is John Ogle. I'm working with a grassroots organization called Atlanta City of Peace. Our goal is to see Atlanta formalized as the global capital of peace. My question is uh, about your father uh, being considered. Before you, before you go a little bit further, is it for Senator Warren? Because I'm, I'm only here as a moderator today. Uh, actually, it's for both of you. Okay, I won't, I won't be answering just so you know. Okay. Because I okay. need to stay in my lane and keep us moving. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Senator Warren, uh, uh, Dr. King is considered Mahatma Gandhi's most globally productive peace movement protege. 
And of course, Coretta Scott King was a great proponent of Mahatma Gandhi as well. I was wondering what you thought about Mahatma Gandhi's uh, proclamation uh, in 1930, 87 years ago. He said, if nonviolence is the law of our being, the future is with woman. <laughs> Do you want to say that again? I'm not sure everyone heard you. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, the most accomplished peace builder of the last thousand year period of human history, said the future is with woman. What do you think about that? <laughs> I was pretty sure they hadn't heard you. I think that women are coming into a moment right now. You know, I, I went to the inauguration uh, uh, and watched uh, the transition of power from President Obama to President Trump. And for me, it was a hard moment. Uh, I, I had not supported President Trump. In fact, fought pretty vigorously and pretty loudly against him. But it was that moment. And the next morning, I was back in Boston and uh, thinking about, what are we going to do? Uh, it's now so many things are on the line. Uh, Health care, for one. It's with given where the Republicans have said they are in the House and the Senate and now, now with President Trump, people are going to lose their health care. Uh, uh, the rules on financial regulation may be rolled back, and that's going to put a lot of people at risk. A lot of people, Department of Education, a lot of people get cheated on for-profit colleges and worrying about these things. And I was thinking about, we have to raise a, an army, an army of our voices, an army of the people. And I was thinking about this as I was heading into a march on that Saturday morning. Uh, it was the Women's March. And, and I was thinking, where's, where's our army going to come from? And I'm, I'm in this car, and we're turning to try to get over to, to uh, uh, where the march is held, right in the center of Boston. And I look up, and, and Families are moving in toward the common, and there's, you know, there's uh, 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 women wearing pink pussy hats, and people <laughs> holding signs, and you know, somebody holding up a sign. Uh, uh, this is my first march, but not my last, and you know, people who are getting all engaged. And I looked over, and there was there was a man with a little girl up on his shoulders, and she was holding up the sign that clearly she had made. And I say that because it had rainbows on it, it had glitter, it had, it had unicorns, it had a, the whole business and horses across it. And what the sign said was, I fight like a girl. And I thought, me too, sweetie. That's what this is going to be about. Me too. girl, to me, is a reminder of why we're all here. It's a reminder that we do take the chance to get together, to see each other, look in each other's eyes, touch each other's hearts. And we take this chance, though, to remind ourselves why. Why we get up every day, why we are called on to lift our voices. There was a moment when I had the chance, the honor, to read your mother's speech. And it didn't work the way I thought it would. <laughs> but the act of persisting meant that millions of people got to hear your mother's voice coming down to us through the years and to remind us what is just is just and each of us is called on to raise our voices for justice. It is such an honor to be here with you. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you. Thank you very much.
for being here with us uh, today. And I, 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 I'm hearing the, the, those words of my mother. It says, struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And I think we stop persisting at some point. And so we're, we're going to keep, yes, we're back, and we're, we're going to keep persisting uh, for this generation, the future generation. And thank you for thank all you. that you are doing um, you. in the name of freedom, justice, and equality. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Senator Elizabeth Warren, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. and an encounter for young people to engage my father's nonviolent philosophy and methodology. This is part of my mother's vision that the next generation would understand how Dr. A word King from our sponsor, the Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. Advisory Council. Please welcome Christine Miller Betts. Good evening. Yeah. On behalf of Senator Emmanuel Jones and the Martin Luther King Advisory Committee, we applaud you for your organizational program and the charge to carry out the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. As penned by Georgia's governor, Nathan Deal, on May 9th, 2011, he says, it is the duty of the Martin Luther King Advisory Committee to promote the principles of nonviolence, peace, social justice, and the awareness of the appreciation of the civil rights and the life work of Martin Luther King, Jr. Therefore, Georgia is honoring the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. with other organizations that ensures his touch of justice, temperance, by nonviolence, by future generations. This will occur. 
our primary mission is to maintain an appreciation of the civil rights movement and the life and the work of Martin Luther King, Jr. Many thanks to all of you who have joined us as we carry out the edit. Thank you and good night. Now it's time for everyone to get involved. Here's executive assistant to our CEO, Ms. Kennedy Mack. Good evening, how are you all? Wasn't that an awesome conversation? So it's now time for us all to get involved. If you pull out your cell phones, we can snap, um, tweet, Facebook, um, or even if you're watching via live stream, um, tweet using the hashtag BCT King Center and let everyone know that you're here um, at these courageous conversations and how they can be a part. You can also text to give at 243725, text Dream Forward, um, and we can all get engaged. Um, so let's get to tweeting. The number is 243725, and you can text Dream Forward and give. Or you can use the hashtag BCT King Center. Y'all got that? Let me say it one more time. B C T King Center. One more time. B Beloved Community Talks. B C T. So let's take a selfie um, so we can get the party started. Are y'all ready? So let's all say BCT on three. One, two, three. BCT! Thank you. So I'll look for your tweets and Snapchats and Facebooks, right? <laughs> I didn't hear a resounding yes. yes. Yes? Okay. Thank you all. A. King. And our co-moderator for this courageous conversation, professor of politics at Oglethorpe University, Dr. Kendra King Momin. Our lead conversationalist for this dialogue, our faith leader and Fox News contributor, Evangelist Alveda King. <laughs> GOP committee woman, Ginger Howard. <laughs> Clinical psychologist and author, Dr. Gloria Morrow. <laughs> Social activist, Tamika Mallory. and President of American Unity Fund and American Unity PAC, Margaret Hoover. For this dialogue, our conversationalist will discuss bridging the racial divide, women in leadership, reaching beyond our differences of faith, politics, and race to humanity and healing. Welcome, ladies. And thank you all for agreeing to be here today um, in this conversation. And uh, I want you to relax. Uh, and uh, we're going to have some um, courageous dialogue 
And um, I want to start by saying um, this, we, we obviously know that this is a very tense uh, time in our nation uh, racially. Uh, just this past weekend, two days ago, um, I was leaving my neighborhood and um, there was this uh, white gentleman, in my, and I live in supposedly a majority black neighborhood, and there was this white gentleman pulling out of uh, one of the streets. I had to right away, and he just insisted on pulling out and pulling out and pulling out, and I was trying to go down the street, and he just kept pulling out. And something uh, arrested me. I would say the Holy Spirit arrested me and said, be still and know that I'm God. <laughs> uh, and when he pulled out, he pulled out and stopped as if to antagonize me. And he looked at me like, I dare you. I double, triple dare you. What you going to do now? And in that moment, I had to make a decision because I could have escalated that situation and who knows, he may have had a weapon, it could have been very bloody. But I had to exercise some discipline in that moment because these are very tense times. And he may have been in the neighborhood just to aggravate uh, a situation. And so when we think about that kind of encounter, I wanna start with uh, Dr. Gloria uh, Morrow, who is a clinical psychologist, um, and um, when we look at uh, the racial climate uh, and we think about our dark past of Jim Crowism, slavery, um, separate but equal, and um, we think about uh, the trauma um, that we faced as a nation, even the, the Civil War. Um, how do you think trauma factors in to the current racial climate? And not just for black people, because a lot of times people feel like we as African Americans are the only ones who suffer the trauma. Now, our trauma is obviously much deeper and longer, but white supremacy has traumatized America and the world. Um, and now we're kind of seeing this culmination of tension that's coming to the surface. And what do we do about it? And how does that factor into our ability to truly address the racial divide? Dr. King, thank you so much for this courageous conversation we're having. Because so many of us are traumatized and re-traumatized because of this long history of racism in our country. And I want to say... We have to know, as Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary talked about, our people have been dealing with post-traumatic slave syndrome. And it manifests itself like post-traumatic stress disorder. But when we have a historical cycle of racism in our history, and then we continue to be re-traumatized and re-traumatized, it makes it very difficult for us to not want to be fighting and angry and hating one another and hating the status quo, hating the enemy and not doing good to the enemy. And so the next part of your question is, what do we do about it? We have but, to but start... Before, before you go there, okay. I'm, I'm going to push you on the other side too. Yes. Okay. Um, and and I, can, I think I can get away with this <laughs> okay. being my daddy's daughter. <laughs> The clashing of trauma, yeah. because is it possibly true also that those who were born into this society who are white are traumatized because some of them didn't create the systemic and institutional racism, but now they are kind of traumatized by it all. I know this is hard for us to hear, mm -hmm. uh, because it's like I was just born and now I'm having to be dealing with all of these confrontations and I, I can't quite make it out because people are talking about my privilege and I've always grown up this way and I never knew anything about privilege because this is the only world I've ever known. It's kind of like when people ask me about being Dr. King's daughter, I don't know about being any other daughter, so this is the only world that I know. Mm -hmm. And until somebody faces them with it, 
um, they don't know, and sometimes we can face it, you know, very confrontational and, and, and with some of our trauma, and how do we deal with it? Because they probably are thinking about, wait a minute, I'm struggling with what happened with my ancestors that I don't agree with, and, and it's just kind of, again, supremacy, white supremacy has traumatized all of us and created a lot of division, black and white class, um, separation and, and all other kind of separations. So the divide and conquer that we see now and, and that all of that trauma that's lying. So I agree, us, I, us, yes, we, we've got to deal with our post-traumatic uh, stre stress syndrome and everything, but and slave syndrome, well, yeah, it's, it's the same though. Um, and people don't realize that. Right. Um, but how do we deal with it both ways? Because you know, it's, it's real. Well, there is actually research that has talked about racial identity development, even in white folks. Yeah. And even when you start at a place of pre-encounter where you see your privilege or don't see your privilege, but you have that ideology, when you have an encounter, such as some of the events we've seen recently in the media that really wake you up to see what's going on. You really want to respond, I believe, as a, another person who is a Caucasian person who has been sitting on the fence and not really understanding what was going on. But then when you do try to make movement, and because of the hurts that black folks and brown folks and all folks have experienced, we don't trust the white community when they do come to try to help when that's what they say they are doing. So then white folks can go right back and start feeling a sense of white guilt, go back to where they were because they tried, but they weren't received. And not only were they not received by us, they may not be received by their mothers and their fathers and their grandparents who may have held some of those other views. So it makes it really, really critical for us to develop the mantra of love. And when I say love, I know a lot of people have different definitions of that, but I'm Christian and I'm not ashamed of that. And so I believe that love is patient, but most of all, love is kind. Mm. And so we have to start exercising love with one another and patience with one another and be able to hear other people's truth. It's very difficult if I've been hurt and traumatized for you to tell me, well, no, you're just playing the race card. Uh -huh. That's very difficult because that just tunes me right out. But if you can acknowledge and sit with me, I know as a psychologist, sometimes I have to sit with clients and talk to them and listen to them about their stories of racism. And if I start counting up in my head the fact, well, you know, this is 2017. You ought to just be over it. And that's what we keep telling people. You ought to just be over it. But I'm not over it. So I need to tell you about it. And then if people really want to turn the page, they'll start talking about their truth. Yes, I'm biased. Yes, I hold stereotypes. Yes, I'm a racist. But I want to recover. And when we get to that place, then we can have an honest dialogue because I don't want to talk to somebody who keeps denying my truth over and over and over again. Wow, Dr. Morrow, you said a mouthful. And you said it in both the practical, the spiritual, and the intellectual, and the psychological, and I think we can receive it. So I just want to tell you thank you for sharing that. Mark, I have a question for you, uh, and it's really something that I uh, admire about you. Uh, recently, you were uh, talking, and you said, it's a time in our nation where the Republican Party, Republicans, card-carrying members either, either, even, they have to make a decision. If you will, they've got to draw a line in the sand, and they're either going to say, listen, our dark past, racism is what it is, and I support it, or I want to cross that line in the sand and be a bridge builder. You challenge people to step up and help build bridges. And what I want to ask you is how can you help others, wherever they stand on the race question, 
How can you help others come into that place of being that you are? Because honestly, when I watch you and I listen to you, it's as if you've had a revolution of values and you understand the worth and soul of humanity. So can you help us understand your journey and what others could do? Oh, that's, that's incredibly kind of you. And I first also want to echo thanks um, to the King Center for having us here. It is a true honor. And I'll just say I have not had a personal revolution. I come from a long line of Republicans who have been on the right side of, of civil rights um, for a long time. So I chose that path, of course. But I just want you to know, in the context of a very, very polarized political climate, it is worth remembering that there have been a long tradition of Republicans who have stood on the side of civil rights uh, all throughout the civil rights movement and all throughout the 60s and 70s and stood with your father. Uh, and, and I currently work for an LGBT organization that I helped found, which helps Republicans uh, make the case in states like Georgia that you shouldn't be able to be fired when you go to work simply because of who you are, which you can do in Georgia. I don't, many people don't know that it's many people don't know that it's perfectly legal if you're gay or lesbian or transgender or bisexual in, in Georgia. It's perfectly legal to be fired from your job, kicked out of your housing, denied a loan, denied service on a jury. Very basic things that um, m most white people take for granted. And uh, the way to win people over, and what I do in our in my work is I talk to Republicans because most of these states that have don't have these discrimination protections are Republican-held states with Republican majority legislatures and Republican governors. And so I have to talk to people who have the same sort of worldview on some issues, but not on the social issues. And in the same way that you said it, it is a human conversation. You, you have to, what was it that, that this wonderful woman uh, asked this question? She said, you have to listen. You always have, you have to start by listening and seeing where people are so you can begin to meet people where they are and then hope that you can take a path, a journey with them. Thank you. Thank you. Tamika, good evening. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, Tamika Mallory. Um, you stepped up to the plate uh, to be a co-chair of this Women's March in January. And on behalf of... The African-American community, we thank you for your leadership. Um, and um, you said something, that it's time for those women of privilege and those with none at all to have courageous conversations about those issues that separate and divide us. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I know in the historical context, when we look at the women's liberation movement, the voices of African-American women were often not included. And this march was a little bit different, and it was because of your leadership. And I know that because we had conversations, and you invited me to share with the leadership of that march before it took place. So just share with us your heart on that, please. Well, for, I also want to join those who have said thank you to you, um, not just for having me here today, but also being a sister to me when I needed you during the Women's March planning. I want to publicly thank you for supporting me um, and just supporting the work that we were doing. Um, you know, <laughs> it's so many elements to the whole Women's March piece and how we came together like a vacuum of people from so many different backgrounds who did not trust one another did not know one another. Um, and I see there's Women's March folks here tonight and, and other family members and friends who have joined. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. First of all, we woke up on November 9th looking at the numbers of who voted for Donald Trump. So mm. when you talk about the trust factor, mm. right there, we had a problem. Mm. Because the first, thing, the first thing we found out was that 53% of white women who voted, voted for Donald Trump. So we were automatically up against this sad reality that once again, you've betrayed me. You've betrayed us. Why? Because you voted for your own personal reasons for this person who we knew was dangerous for our communities and dangerous for our world. So 
for women of color, and particularly black women who we know voted over 90%, 94% for Hillary Clinton, whether we liked her or not. Like, we didn't go to the polls voting for Hillary because we were so excited, but we knew that what was on the other side was too dangerous. So, so, we, so we did what we had to do. And I think that what we come up against is these moments where white people in general have another, yet another opportunity to do the right thing, to show that we are all in this together, and it breaks down. So in the women's march space, people who I called and asked other black women and women of color, and said, will you come and support and be a part of us? They were like, you must be out of your mind. You're asking me now to do this after we see the numbers. They need a march. Let them go and have a march with their mamas and sisters and family members and friends and work it out because there's some stuff going on over there. And what we said to your point about taking one for the team, we could not allow a convening to happen in this country where women of any one race or one element would go and speak on behalf of all women and the issues would be narrowly focused. So that was one part of it. So we did not just want a seat at the table, we had to stand up in the middle of the table and say, if you're gonna talk about reproductive rights, you, you have to look at the fact that some women in certain communities won't even have children at all. Abortion is not even our issue, we didn't even get there yet. We're on the fact that we can't have kids, we're scared they're gonna get shot because of what is happening in our communities. And so we, so we had to be there to make sure that the conversation was, was a full conversation about all of our issues. So that was, that was one part of it. But the other part, looking at the humanity piece and what I think your father would want us to say. There was 47% of people who, who, of white women who did not vote for Donald Trump. And they deserved to be able to be at the table. And even in the 53%, some people woke up and said, oh my God, I may have made a mistake. And they deserve to be at the table. And it is incumbent upon us to create space for everyone to be a part of this movement. We cannot do it alone. And we realize that trying to lead movements or have movements that is just a solo group of people have never worked. It is because we are able to change the minds and hearts of others and win them over to our cause that we have been able to make the strides of your father and so many who have fought before us. So the Women's March, although it was stressful and it was very difficult and we had some, we cried some tears and we still, we, we are now an organization, we still have some difficult moments. We recognize that the beauty in all of us is that all of us were present. We were all at the table. Everyone came with a different experience. And so now, when you look at what feminism in this age, in 2017 and beyond, what it looks like, it looks like all of us who are sitting here and not just one group of people. Before, before she, she's going to ask a question, but I'm going to ask a question later of each, each one of you um, because I want to I wanna push us because the, the, the danger in sometimes these conversations is that we can become very political, all of us. Um, and we've got to find, we've got to find the win-win road forward because we're going to tear apart if we're not careful. So we're, we're going to ask that question later, but I'm going to go ahead and, and toss it to you, Dr. Moman. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret, at least my secret. In the African-American community, when you're about to ask a question and get in trouble, you invoke the auntie clause. <laughs> so auntie Albita. <laughs> you know I love you, and you know you still reserve the right to spank me if you want to. <laughs> But I want to understand, and this is coming from the heart, um, anyone who knows anything about you uh, knows about your strong faith, but they also know about your conservative views. Uh, they know that you support President Trump, and they also know that you champion nonviolence. You are the direct bloodline of a family and heritage of nonviolence. My, my heart thought for you and question is simply this. 
Can you help us understand how to deal with our president who has on occasion been racist and misogynistic? What can we expect as women who are trying to heal the soul of a nation, going back to what Tamika said about trust, when our trust is violated, we go into our shells. Going back to what Margaret said, she said she, she chose this path. So how can we choose the righteous path when we have a leader who sometimes seems, in all due respect, a little unrighteous? Wow. <laughs> Can we do a little history lesson? Absolutely. In 1968, this is a year before I was married, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., my uncle, was assassinated. His brother, Reverend A.D. King, my dad, was on his way to get his sister-in-law, Coretta Scott King, and they were going to go to Memphis to bring my uncle's body back. I had to blame somebody, and I began to rant and cry. Daddy, I hate white people. I hate white people. They killed my uncle. My daddy, in the midst of his grief, said, Acts 17, 26, of one blood, God made all people to live together on the face of the earth. We are one blood. They are not separate races. Racism is a lie, and racism is a sin. He began to rock me in his arms. He said, white people, march with us. White people, pray with us. White people, go to jail with us. White people, die with us. White people did not kill my brother nor your uncle. The devil did. Now, Daddy said that. It took me years to totally get there with white privilege and all that. And I've had people repent and cry. I'm so sorry. I am a racist. Help me in all of this. I was born again in 1983 and my heart changed. And I was able to accept we are not separate races. We are one human race. Different skin color with red blood. So the racism issue, um, Tom Murphy, who's the Speaker of the House when I was a state legislator. I remember when we were working for the holiday bill for Bernice's mother. They would ball up the bill and throw it in a spittoon and spit on it. All that Hosea Williams and I and others were fighting to get the holiday bill passed, and it was passed. And George Wallace was a bad racist. He repented and he changed, you see. So in this current, last current election, yes, I voted for President Donald John Trump. I started out with Dr. Ben Carson, and I ended up voting for President Trump. And when I did that, the first thing he said, it wasn't even about the abortion. Daddy King saved me from abortion in 1950. My mama wanted to abort me. And he said, hey, that's a little light-skinned baby girl with bright red hair. She's going to bless me and people. I saw her in a dream three years ago. And so his prophecy, he had a dream, and that saved me. I had two abortions and a miscarriage secretly. And I repented for those in 83. They had civil rights, too. I just didn't know it. So I've gone through all of this. So President Donald John Trump, candidate, then said on TV in a debate, it's wrong to rip little babies apart and throw them in the garbage. I said, wow, I happen to agree with that. But guess what he said? They said, what are you going to do about racism? He said, give everybody in America a job so they can have a job, they can be safe, have somewhere to live. That made sense to me. And there have been one million jobs created in America since he became president. Now, y'all are laughing. That's okay. I didn't jump up and say that when you all agreed. You see, you agree when you agree when things are said. You don't boo. You don't agree with me, so you want to boo. That's okay. I'm 67 years old. I can take it. So, every president... I went to the White House with President Reagan, President Carter, President Clinton, President Obama. Told him, you were there. I said, I love you. He said, I love you. you. Okay. Did it mean I agree with everything? He said, no. But I pray for those who are in authority. That's the Bible. So I can live a peaceful life. 
I have loved every president. I love this president. And I pray. So, if you have a problem with the president, pray for the president. Pray for the members of Congress. I don't know, you all weren't backstage with Senator Warren and I. We embraced each other. We affirmed each other. We said we love each other. We do. Do we agree on policy? Not at all. But I have learned, first from Jesus, my Lord and Savior, my grandfather, Martin Luther King Sr., my uncle, Martin Luther King Jr., my daddy, A.D. King, who was killed the year after his brother. If we cannot love, listen, and communicate. Now, I still have to forgive my cousin, Dr. Bernice King. She went out to do a speech. I was sitting on the front row. She looked and she said, I voted for Mrs. Hillary Clinton. She voted for President Trump. And the whole congregation said, Whoa! And, and, and Bernice later, Dr. Bernice said later, God, I wish you could have seen their faces. I didn't know they were going to hate you like that. Did you apologize? I forgive yet? her. I love her. I love everyone here. And I thank you for the opportunity to explain. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And, and I tell people all the time, this did not tear our family apart because we are steeped in my father's philosophy and methodology of, of nonviolence. Um, Can you give the six steps? Somebody wanted to know what they are. You want me to do Yeah, I'll, I'll give them. I'll give okay, them make sure in, we do. In, in okay. closing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I wanted to say, because I know this was a lot for some of us to swallow <laughs> in, in this audience. Um, and, and the, the, you know, tonight is not about agreeing as much as it is about listening. Um, and sometimes you can hear behind what people are saying, too. Um, and don't just listen to the words. You have to listen to the spirit and the attitude and the heart behind the words as well. Um, but I, I want to um, shift gears a, a, a little bit to, to speak to um, um, Ginger because... Um, as we think about um, uh, President Trump and, and the current climate and, and the current um, um, environment and all of the tension, the polarization that exists um, in, in these times, um, I'm, I'm just wondering how we can find that, that, that meeting place. Maybe we can never do it. I mean, maybe I'm too idealistic, um, but I, I just see... Uh, that the way we're going in this nation is, is on a dangerous course. Um, and um, even though Vita and I uh, have different political uh, ideology, uh, there's some things we agree on politically, uh, and there, there are other things we, we disagree on. Um, but we find, found a way to really create relationship, um, and she probably ain't going to never change. <laughs> God bless her. <laughs> You're supposed to be apologizing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, as, a, as a woman of faith yourself um, and, and a conservative, um, can, can you help us um, understand how conservative, conservatives, especially women, can find a way to bridge some of the divide um, particularly with the African-American community because they're those that feel like uh, conservatives uh, don't identify with the issues that systematically affect um, the African-American community. And, and how, how can we move forward and have more conservatives, and especially because we as women, I think, can be a, a, a little bit more uh, reasonable because of our heart mm -hmm. than men. Now, I'm not trying to be, what's the opposite of uh, sexist? <laughs> I guess I'm a reverse sexist. Is that what you want to call mm -hmm. it? But, but how, 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 can we find, um, how can we find that connection? How can conservative women really connect and help people know and understand that you understand and, and what can you do in the, in the conservative community to really um, address some of these. Because these, for us, 
we hear a lot of times, and, and, and if, if, if I had a conversation now with a group of pastors, especially evangelical pastors, they would say, I have black friends, you know, I love black people. And, and that's one thing, and that's, a, that's an important thing. It's very critical. But then there's this separation when it comes to, if you love me, then how can, how can you not stand with me in my struggle? And so how do we, how do we get to that place? Thank you so much. First of all, I want to agree with everyone. I'm so humbled and honored to be a part of this panel on, and to celebrate the life and legacy of Martin Luther King. And Thank I you. so honor your father and your uncle, Alveda. And I think that that is a wonderful question. And I think there are three important facts from my point of view, three things to bring to the table when having this discussion. And number one, somebody earlier asked the question, it's a desire to really listen and to really get into the other person's perspective because I don't know certain things about your walk or your walk or your walk. But if I'm sincerely willing to listen to your stories and to hear and empathize, then I think that that's one of the things that we can do. Secondly, a posture of humility. I'm the first to tell you, I don't know what you've been through, so many of you. I don't understand. And so I, I honestly admit that, and I humble myself to say, explain to me, how can I better hear you? How can I better stand with you? And thirdly, to me, the most important as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a recognition that all humans have value. And God was so creative in the way he made us, different color skins and different tribes and nations, but ultimately we come from one tribe, one blood, and every person has value. And as your father said, judge not a man by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. So my heart is God's heart, and I may be a Republican, but I must say Jesus was not an elephant or a donkey, but he was the lamb that was slain for the salvation of the world. And he came to give us the ministry of reconciliation. So Jesus is our prototype. What did he do? He came as a man on the cross and, and identified with us. So my first point is dialogue. So thank you for having me here because that's, that's what I see. Okay. I think we're going to open it up for some... One second. Questions. I've got to, and my heart was pounding so fast, and, sure. and I knew I very short. <laughs> Women in America, period, started out with a common enemy. They thought it was the white slave master, the wife of the slave master with the Caucasian skin, and the mistress of the slave master who had black or brown skin. And so they were very frustrated because this was a time when women were chattel, just like slaves were chattel. And so the mistress says, I'm going to figure out a way. I'm not going to have too many of his babies because he's not treating me right. The slave, hey, we'll figure out how if he gets you pregnant, we're not going to let him keep selling your babies and making money. So they came together. They were kind of rivals, but they had a common adversary. They thought it was that man, but that dirty system that was once in this nation, pitted everybody against each other. The women became strange allies, and it made a strange fruit. But today, women of every skin color are crossing across these barriers and saying our worth is equal to every human being, just like we are one blood, we are one race. So women, no matter what color your skin is today, we can get together and be sisters. And this is happening. I didn't know how to say that, but I thought that had to be exposed. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about today as this conversation about race is also the xenophobia that is often combined with racism. Um, and often... <laughs> Often I see uh, in faith spaces, we talk about compassion and love for one another, but what I'm seeing right now is a lack of compassion when we're talking about real issues. Um, I'm not seeing compassion when we're talking about the arrival of refugees and immigrants from countries. <laughs> uh, 
these people are coming from countries where there is no compassion left. So how are we as women and as leaders in our communities trying to teach that compassion and just going beyond the love and the empathy that I think all of us are trying to get to, but how do we teach compassion and turn that compassion into action? Dr. Mara. That is such a wonderful question. And we all have the capacity for compassion. But if we do not make ourselves available to hear and listen and to have empathy for other people's journey and struggle, we will never develop compassion. It starts right there. Um, someone once said that as long as one of us is oppressed, all of us are oppressed. So if my sister is oppressed, I'm too oppressed. And that should give me a sense of compassion to fight for justice and to make sure my voice is heard to help other sisters. So it's going to take us to, you know, really be careful about vulgar careerism. W.E.B. Du Bois said that we have to really be careful with that because sometimes we have to move our agenda out of the way so that we can look at the agenda of the beloved community. And that is going to cause us to have compassion. Before you ask your question, I'm sorry. Um, both Tamika and Margaret, I believe, are going to have to leave us to catch flights. So you, you can't hold tight for a few minutes, OK? Um, and so I wanted to ask you all just, just a, a closing. You have a little bit of time? You're buying us a little time? See what women, all right. see what women do. When women come together, they <laughs> say, we have time. So let's give a round of applause, because they're literally supposed to be going to catch flights. Good evening, thank you. My name is Chalice Montgomery. I'm running for Congress in the 10th District of Georgia. I'm a Democrat and I'm a woman of faith. I come from a children's ministry background and I have a background in children's Christian education. One of the largest issues in our district is trust. And I have a hard time talking to people sometimes because the Christian message has been so co-opted by folks who would choose to use it as a weapon, that that bridge alone is a very difficult one to cross. And I would just like your thoughts as a panel on how we can do that together as a district, as a state, and as a nation. Hello? Okay, great. So I don't necessarily have the best answer for that, but there is, I'm glad you said something was in your spirit. It certainly something is in mine, and I know that it's in this room, and when you talk about the Christian faith and it sort of being used and co-opted, this whole thing that I keep hearing, even here in this panel, about us loving one another and being able to sort of, you know, not agree, but still work together, it's a very dangerous statement and I'm going to say that because people are literally dying so if you and I'm like really shaken because I want to make sure that I say what I'm saying in love but if you support someone who is a person who literally has put my life in danger I cannot work with you I don't respect you Because you, you pretty much are standing there watching something, someone with a gun loaded and cocked at my head and trying to find reasons why you can support that person who has put my child, my 18-year-old son is a young black man living in America that at any moment he could be walking down the street and based upon Jeff Sessions, who is the new attorney general who wants to put mandatory minimums and other things in place in this country. One second. I, 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 wanna, I want to do justice to speak on behalf of those of you who I know are feeling what I'm feeling, but let me just say this. Beth Sessions is an attorney general who was chosen by Donald Trump. This man is a racist whose history is nothing but 
racism, and the destruction of the black community. This is who was chosen to be the attorney general in a time where black men and women lose their lives to police officers unarmed in this country every 28 hours. If you support a president who selected that type of person to be the leader of this land at this time, how do I love you and support you and work with you? How can I do that? All right, all right. I don't know how. Okay. So maybe someone here can tell me how do we love each other when you are against me and it is okay with you that I am literally dying? Tamika, I, I, totally, I totally hear you and I respect you. But our premise tonight is to not attack people. Let me, let me, let, let, let me, but let, let me finish because our whole job is to listen to each other. No, no, you're good. You're good because I feel... Let Can me. I just say, and I don't want to, I, I know that it's not, it's not right. For, I'm just, let me just say this. The problem is we keep walking away having fluff conversations and we keep coming back to the same place. We got to have real conversations about real issues in real ways or else our people are going to be led to slaughter. We don't have time to have fake conversations and fluff conversations. So I'm not here for that. Okay, I'm here to have a real conversation because my son's life is in danger right now. Tamika. Let me, let me jump. Can, yeah, but let me jump. Can, let me I, jump. can I jump in? Let me jump. I got you. Listen. Can, can, can listen, I, my, you're, you're my sister. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me, let me, let me, because we, we're meeting now. And our whole premise tonight is about having courageous conversation. And that's so, courageous. Let, let me finish. I study nonviolence. I just finished submitting the two-day nonviolence curriculum. Bernice will tell you, I told her three days ago, you cannot study Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence without putting on your big girl panties because it's going to make you look at the issues inside of you where you are struggling to forgive even opinions that are not like yours. Let me, let me, let me help you. Last year in Shambly, Georgia, at 11 p.m., my husband and I got pulled over 10 minutes from my university for an inspired tag. They surrounded us in three police cars and for over an hour humiliated us. It wasn't until I said to the sergeant, because again, they tell you when you don't feel safe, call for a higher authority. The sergeant was worse than the arresting officer who pulled us over with a broken tail light himself. After an hour of badgering us, I finally said, sir, it's ironic that you're pulling us over when I'm on CNN International talking about these same issues. But I had to feel it in a way to understand both sides. Here I am with a PhD and could have almost got my brain, brains blown out if I didn't handle that situation in a de-escalated manner. I teach the politics of hip-hop, so I know how to keep it real. I don't want my auntie to be attacked because just because I don't understand where she is today doesn't mean as I grow and as I go that I may not get to a place of peace with her. So that's all. I wasn't coming at you. I'm not coming at the issues in our nation because they are real. Sorry. Can they I are very real, but I don't want my auntie to be attacked because she has to leave here. She's a 67 year old soul. And we say there's worth and, and value in every human being. We've got to respect every voice that's up here. So, so. And um, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna challenge all of us because this, this is difficult. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of pain. Um, I was telling somebody, there's a reason why the hospital when you go to the emergency room, has that chart, pain chart, from zero to 10. They determine the prescription by the level of pain that an individual has. And so while there is pain maybe across the board, there are levels of pain. And there's a context to the pain, as Dr. Morrow said. And so as we are addressing these very difficult issues, the history of the African-American community, the pain that comes out of that community, 
is not just a history, it's a current pain. And that pain is escalated at number 10. And we have to acknowledge that pain, be true about that pain. But in addressing it and having the proper prescription, I just want to challenge all of us that in the realm of activism, when we are, when we are saying or invoking the name of Martin Luther King Jr., we have to be careful. Because Dr. King requires us, and I'm going to say this to me because I hear the pain, I hear the fear, I hear the worry, the anxiety, um, and, and this is real for black America, with, without a doubt. But he, his philosophy is based in love. And so if we're going to invoke him, we have to dare to understand him and try to embrace it. Otherwise, we shouldn't invoke him. Because he taught us that we can love people who hate us and hurt us. He taught us that. It, he embodied that. In fact, I believe Jesus sent him because we forgot about that. And he may have to send somebody else again in fleshly form so that we understand that. And so I hope that you will find it in your heart. Not because she's my cousin. It could be somebody else. That you will find it in your heart to, to love, in spite of, because number one, what was happening in the black community was happening before Trump. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's be clear, you all, because there's a lot of emphasis on Trump. But what has been happening in America happened before President Donald Trump. And guess what? It's going to happen even more after President Donald Trump if we don't figure out how to ease the tension because we're going to end up in a racial riot which is not going to be healthy for anybody in this nation. And that's why I have to stand on the side of nonviolence and I have to stand on the side of love because I know in the end it has the power to transform people. I've seen the George Wallace be transformed. I've seen over and over people who are hateful. I sat on the stage with a Ku Klux, former Ku Klux Klan member who was a grand wizard back in January who obviously did some horrendous stuff and did things and said things about my father. And I saw the transformation of a man. But that's because another man dared to cross over and meet him and say, how can you hate me and you don't even know me? How? And so he dared to cross over because at the end of the day, yes, we have systemic racism. Yes, we have institutional racism. But those systems and institutions have been created by people. And if we don't work on the people, we're going to keep perpetuating it. And if we shut down the dialogue and the communication, no matter how hard it is, and yes, we have to be true. I'm not saying we shouldn't be true. We have to tell the truth. If we, if we shut down the dialogue and the communication, we're never going to get there. And your son, everybody else's son, daughter, may end up in their graves. And that's not where we want to head. We, we got to turn this around. We, we definitely have to turn this around. And so... I, huh? She said, uh -huh. how can I love you? Right. Listen, okay, listen, Peter we, said she wants to answer. We've got a can, whole line of people that are can, anxiously waiting for questions. So, so right. let, let me do this. Can I quickly say how? I, I and myself had no ability to forgive the people who bombed our house in 63 with us in the bed. And we could all die. We were children. Or who killed my uncle. Or who killed my dad, threw him in a swimming pool. But there is the love of God that does transform, and it lives in my heart. And I'm able to override fear. My children say sometimes now, Mommy, be careful. You know people, not everybody doesn't love you. But does that keep me from getting on that plane and going and proclaiming love? Now, I, I really do love you, Tamika. I don't even take that personally. You don't understand how I could vote for Donald Trump. That's okay. You know, I did. So, and I do not apologize. But it's okay. I don't even mind if people or mad with me, because you're not angry with me. But the strength to love, her daddy wrote a book, and my daddy A.D. was there with him along, all along the way, Aunt Christine, Aunt Coretta, Mama, 
You know, they were, we all lived this. Bernice and them did. Uncle Emil, the fact when he, he had to go out and leave his children with his wife and do what he did. But there is a strength to love that can only come from God. It is bigger than fear. Perfect love that is agape love casts out fear. So now, see, I felt nothing. When you did all that, my heart was weeping with you. I care about your children. I don't want anything to happen to your children. I've got six living children and ten grandchildren. God, I want them to be okay. So I pray to God that everyone in this room finds the strength to love, and there are six principles of nonviolent conflict reconciliation. They're on the King Center website. There are six steps to nonviolent conflict resolution. I always say, Jesus said, turn the cheek. If they slap you on both cheeks, what are you going to do? Turn. You have to love God. You've got to reach into that well. And you answer the fear and hate with love. Thank you so much. You all, thank you for your patience. We are over time. We're going to go to Margaret, and then we're going right to okay. my patient person yeah. right here. You're thank so you free. so much. I just, I so appreciate, Dr. King, your, your way of sort of bringing that around um, and, and sort of grounding it in love. And part of the reason I know that I'm on this panel is because I'm a Republican who has taken the time to, and used the platform I have on CNN to talk about, talk to other Republicans about why I believe it's time for Republicans to, to, to be honest about our history in the Republican Party and what, what sort of not knowing that history has been and, and the effect that it's had. Equally, Tamika, I think it's, it's Noam Chomsky came out the other day and, and spoke out in really strong terms against Antifa, right? And I just think this is a moment, yesterday in Berkeley, there were riots and there were five people hurt, very, very seriously hurt by Antifa, right? This is a time where our politics, we have to be bigger than our politics, even though we're political activists, we both are. But we have to sort of lead by example. I think you just we find that spot in love because um, we have to denounce nonviolence on all sides right now. Otherwise, this, this is a tinderbox and it can I think spin you used out. the wrong word. Go ahead. Uh, so can, Go ahead. I, 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 I'm sorry. And I know I have to leave, and I probably will never be invited again. And, <laughs> and it's okay. But. Yes, you I will. Just, I love you at least. I, know, I don't and, know about anybody else, but I love there, you. There's absolutely no hate in my heart. The spirit of what I do every day is love. The fact that I fight for people of all races and all of us, it is in love. But I, I want to say that I think when we talk about nonviolence, and of course I have no right to speak on your father's um, uh, theology or ideology, but I think when we talk about nonviolence, I'm not sure that that means that we should not, as you said, be able to tell the truth about what is hurting our communities. And I asked the question, how? I didn't say that I can't, I won't. I'm saying how, because right now, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm having a difficult time and it's not, it has nothing to do with the sister here. But when you're on a panel and you're speaking, you're representing people and ideas and thoughts and ways. So it's not a personal thing at all because you and I can break bread together. I'm just saying that people who ha are supporting not a president, because Dr. King, what you said is right. Women's March for me was not about Donald Trump. I never even went there about Donald Trump. If we never said his name, that would have been better for me. But what he represents right now is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And when people say that they love you, but yet they support that, it is very, it's very difficult and conflicting. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where I'm gonna leave it. And I thank you very much for having me here today and love to you all. And I love you and appreciate you. And um, I don't, I don't, um, yeah. Hello. Know, know that, um, huh? Yeah, I got it. Know that you will be invited back because cause, cause I like this kind of conversation because we can't, we can't get there unless we go there if you understand what I mean. And on your way out, I'm gonna have Dr. Morrow, just, just because of her background, to address that question to the audience because as she said, how do, how do we do that?
Yeah. How do we do that with all of this pain? Well, Not just pain, these realities that are happening on a daily basis where right. people are abusing and exploiting people and killing people. Well, it's like I said, you cannot deny the pain. And I think the pain has to speak. I want to say that this is a courageous young woman. Yes. Yeah. But I also want to say, and I'm going to tell you, I had a whole different ideology when I came here, when I discovered and I looked up everyone and I said, oh, Lord, what am I in for? But I also respect Alveda King because it takes courage in this crowd to come in here and speak her truth. Yeah. And that's what it takes. That's why we can't get any further because we can't sit down and have the conversations and move into action. It will be my greatest joy to get to know people who I see differently and sit down and have that courageous one-on-one -on -one conversation so that I can move into a place of reconciliation. That's what we need. We need reconciliation. And we will never solve this problem because we get all excited we do all of this, but when it's time to go vote, when it's time to get involved in your community, when it's time for you to address your church, you are absolutely silent. We've got to take personal responsibility for where we are. Amen. We can't blame anybody. We've got to take responsibility. Some of us have arrived in our own minds, but I have a news flash for you. You have not. Things can change drastically in your life. So you don't have the right to hold your nose in the air, whether you're for the right or the left, and think that you have the answers when anything can go wrong in your life. So we need each other. I need this young woman. I'm going to link up to her so tight she won't know what happened to her. <laughs> I need my sister on the end. I'm going to link up with her. I need my sister. Uh, my sister, my sister, my sister. We may not all agree, but I'm going to get to say how I feel and do not try to tell me that it is not legitimate that I feel that way. It takes truth Amen. and honesty. That's what Amen. courageous conversations are about. If not, we're just sitting here having another activity. Amen. I could be in sunny California, <laughs> but I'm here tonight. I paid my own way to be here. So I could be in this conversation. Amen. Because this conversation is critical. Folks, our people are dealing with depression, anxiety, the suicide rate for our young people, especially young black males, is alarming. We do not have time to fight that fight because you're trying to find, fight a systemic fight. We've got to get an individual fight going where I say, what can I do? How can I be the solution? Mm -hmm. And I want to ask all of those who stood up and did all of that, Let's all find out what we can do to be part of the solution. Because if not, you are part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Morrow. Safe travels. Thank you. Safe travels. Vita, don't look. We're going to take a few questions from the audience. So. Not to repeat the person in the, this is less of a question than a statement. If people who are white in this room and even some African Americans and descendants of the victims of the transatlantic slave trade want to understand how we got to here, I highly recommend reading The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkinson, which talks about the Great Migration, which was the, the, either the second largest or the largest m migration of people from one place to another just happened to all be in America and talks about Jim Crow and how it came about and how Reconstruction failed. And it's such an important part of this conversation and to understand where this fear, I'm Jewish and the reality is tonight, I had a lot of fear in my heart because I kept hearing Jesus' name invoked without a consideration with the fact that ask us how we love our, our tormentors. And so I, 
I appreciate that fear and I love the work that you're doing and I want to learn more about it because it's so important epigenetics. But please read The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkinson and then I hope you'll have us back and we can talk about it. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to take two more questions and we're going to wrap. Thank you all who've stayed over time this evening. We appreciate that. Hi, my question is for Dr. Morrow and for the Kings. Um, we talk a lot about these crucial conversations um, amongst people who are different from one another, um, but we also have crucial conversations that need to happen with people who are like us. We have families who are being torn apart. We have marriages that are breaking up. We have holidays people are avoiding because everybody knows where everybody's at. We've ripped the Band-Aid off some really ugly wounds that have been here in America for a very long time, and we can't hide from them anymore. And so things have become really difficult in some of our families, and we're hurting, and it's difficult to look them in the eye sometimes when you know they don't support your access to health care. We know they don't act, support your relationships that you have. And so what is your advice to those of us who are having those kinds of pains within our families? And how do you come together as a family and continue to have those conversations and not let it tear you apart? Yeah. Thank you. We love each other. That's how we do it. We really do love each other. Sometimes that seems we simple, have to right? get help. That seems simple, right? Right. You, you, we do. I, I just dismiss some of her stuff, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> if I think about it too long, it'll make me mad. And I'm, I'm being very serious about that. Um, I, I've tried to, to, to discipline myself to the place where I give space to people to have their own perspectives. Uh, I haven't always been that way. Um, and, and so, what I do internally is I listen and hear, but I also recognize that's her world and that's her truth and it does not have to violate me, that I can still have my beliefs and my, my principles and what I connect with is where we have things in common. And at the end of the day, I know it sounds simplistic, but because we were raised in a family of love and forgiveness, um, we don't hold those things against one another. And so we can still connect, we can hang out. She, she cook, I eat her food. <laughs> uh, we have a, a, lot, a lot of uh, uh, dialogues. Um, and, um, you know, we, we pray for each other. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to change her. In fact, there may be a reason why all of this is happening to all of us. Um, you know, um, I don't believe it was necessarily, she might disagree with this, I don't believe that it was God's perfect will that President Trump be the president. I do believe that it was his permissive will. Because I have never before seen... We agree seen on that. It was his permissive. I people, agree with you. Okay. I've never before seen so many people come together. I mean, we had gotten to a place where we were becoming very complacent and apathetic as a nation, and something had to wake us up. I think we thought we had arrived because we had an African-American president, and something had to wake us up and help us find our commonality and our humanity. This is forcing us. These conversations did not take place under President Barack Obama or any other president. But they're taking place now, and this stuff has been hidden under the surface for so many years. Mm -hmm. And it has to come out. So God had to allow, as he did in biblical times, he put unrighteous judges in place because people had gotten away from certain things to call them back. And so, believe it or not, it could be our blessing in disguise to take us to another level. Thank you. Thank that doesn't excuse any of the injustice though. But even sometimes with some of that, that stuff calls us up to a higher level. And that's gonna happen generation after generation after generation. Unfortunately, they're always gonna be sacrificial lambs. And you have to pray without rancor 
or hate in your heart. Pray for those who are in authority that we can have a peaceful life. It just so happens I have loved all the presidents. None of them were perfect. I've been in the White House with several of them in an advisory capacity. And I have really, I pray for them exactly the same way. God guide them, give them wisdom, give them grace. And somebody says, well, don't pray that for Trump. He don't need any grace. Well, what in the world? Or don't pray that for President Obama. He doesn't need grace. Is there a person breathing that does not need? Now, I didn't say deserve, but need. It's a human need. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. We're going to take one final question here. Okay. Good evening. My name is uh, Ken Wainwright, and I proudly, proudly want to announce that I have organized almost every anti-Trump protest here in Atlanta, Georgia. And the key word that I want the panel to think about is this word called compromise. And what are we willing to not compromise for? I am a part of and a member of this church. One of the strongest men lead this church, Dr. Warnock. And he did not compromise and did not back down to some of the policies that this man that you voted for stood for. Even when there was a man with a badge and a gun, he still didn't back down. He didn't compromise. He didn't visit a Trump Tower. We aren't, this isn't an anti-Trump deal, even though we want to say that it's not about Trump. We mentioned Trump almost 10, 12 times here. The reality is that what our sister Mallory was talking about really is talking the same way we talk in our kitchens and in our living rooms. We're not talking too much about love and connection because the, the reality is, the reality is that I'm a Christian, but I'm not better than Muslims. And we have a president who's pushing that there should be a Muslim ban. You understand? I, I'm not gay, but I have LGBT brothers and sisters who need advocacy stronger than ever. <laughs> Women need advocacy stronger than ever. I understand that. We know what's going on when it comes to domestic violence. We understand what's going on when it comes to the homeless rate, especially in Atlanta. Especially single parent mothers, a product that I'm, I, I'm involved I, I don't in. Wanna, I don't want to interrupt you, sir. But I know we have a, I, yeah, we have a question. Let's get to the question. My yeah. question is, and this is what's important. Thank you. <laughs> this is my question is, it's a question and a comment. And the question has to deal with the fact that on this level, people who are in this room, what do we do to make sure that the black community is still advancing, that the Muslim community is still advancing, that everyone that has, this, this, that has been attacked during his campaign gets proper advocacy how do we come together to make sure that these policies that are, that, are, that are being created to make people feel less than come together to where now we're coming together and we're stronger because of the ignorance that came into this Trump policy? And by the way, the reason, I sir, want to say this too, sir, we're, we're, not, we're, not, sir, we're not mad at- Sir, sir, we are violating the time of I, everyone I understand in this that, room. But, but, sir, sir, could you please, in the spirit of love, but, could you yield the floor so Dr. Morrow could answer the question? I, I, we'll be here I understand, after this but, but I also want to say, like, I want sir, to say that, the, that the crowd is in disappointment that the King family would go sir, into a, a voting booth. Sir, 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 please. This is, not, this is not a form of attack. This is a spirit of love. Sir, sir, in all due respect, I went in the voting booth and voted for Hillary Clinton. So that's not the entire King family. Let's okay, just, let's just so, go, so let's be, what we have to do is make sure that we keep our conversations not attacking people, but no. issues. I said issues. Policies. That, that's fine, but I'm saying, it, again, this is what I want to challenge everybody in the world on. If we're going to invoke Dr. King, we have to practice his way. 
because otherwise we're being inconsistent. We don't attack the people. We attack the issues and we do information gathering because you were getting ready to make a statement about King family. You didn't even say a member of, you said and King And that would have been family. inaccurate. I said, I said, a tr I God said loves Trump. Muslims, Jews, Caucasians, everybody, gay, straight. John 3.16 did not divide anything human. It doesn't. It says God so loved the world. Abraham had two sons, you know, uh, and so, and, and Adam and Eve had, you know, all, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. And that's where all the nations came. Uh, Noah did that. So God loves everybody. And so the blood of Christ was shed for everybody. And we are not going to divide. And we are one human race. We are one blood. Dr. Morrow, last word. I had the wonderful privilege of being on CNN when President Obama was going through inauguration the first time. And I had the chance to actually go to DC, but I wanted to stay in my community, so I did it in Los Angeles and they taped it. In Los Angeles, we had a town hall meeting because there was a really important question. The fact that we had our first African-American president was exciting. We, I can't even tell you. My mom and dad, they adopted him. We just thought he was our long lost brother. We knew that this was a good thing. But the question was, where do we go from here? We have to take individual responsibility. And I said this earlier, how are we doing with our own children? How are we doing in our community? And this is also an example. How do we treat each other with respect, even when we disagree? How do we do that? Because to me, that shows that we are in a healthier place. And when we are in a healthier place, we can get some things accomplished. I don't care who it is. So I think it's so important for us to remember, we've got to roll our sleeves up and do our work. If you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, then do something about it. If you're angry, turn that anger into something positive and do something about it. Because if not, we'll come back next year, we'll have the same conversation and nothing will change. Thank you. I wanna thank everybody who stayed here to the end. Um, being a trooper, and as we said from the very beginning, this was not going to be an easy um, conversation. These conversations have to continue. I encourage you all to continue uh, these conversations because if we do not, we're going to come apart in America. And I'm not encouraging people to, to sugarcoat anything. I appreciate the brother that just asked the question. I appreciate Tamika and all of uh, the things that she shared and, and stated. Um, because the Bible says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Uh, and so, again, we have to find a way to cross over, connect with one another, and have these difficult dialogues where we can. And this was something that we tried to do on tonight, and I want to encourage everyone um, to um, go to um, our website, website, which is... Um, what is our website? <laughs> BelovedCommunityTalks.org. Download the toolkit to help start your own courageous conversation. Um, and be sure to share your conversation with us via the website and on social media. But I want to challenge everybody here who remains. If you have a, if you have a cell phone, uh, we need your support to continue the work similar to what we're doing here tonight. We also do uh, nonviolence education and training, nonviolence 365 education uh, and training in the spirit of my father, Martin Luther King Jr. And so next year, we're gonna be uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of my father's assassination on April 4th, and we're gonna do it April 4th through the 9th, and then the King Center's founding, uh, which was June 26, 1968, and we will have activities from June 22nd through the 26th in 2018. And so <clears throat> in honor of that anniversary, I'm going to ask everybody in here if you would donate $50 to the King Center 
so that we can continue the great work we're doing in the name of Martin Luther King Jr. and to continue the legacy of Coretta Scott King. And you can text DREAM forward. I know everybody can remember that because we do need to carry the DREAM forward. And it's 243725. Please don't play that. 2430, it's too late because somebody already got the big one. 243725. I'm going to make you go to sleep with it. 243725. Dream forward. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting us. And we look forward to seeing you again. Have a good night and a safe night. is an experience and an encounter for young people to engage my father's nonviolent philosophy and methodology. This was part of my mother's vision that the next generation would understand how Dr. King was able to bring about change in society. Everything's violent right now. Everything is laced with some kind of violence. And we gotta change that direction. And in my personal opinion, it's gonna take a cadre of young people who've been taught another way, they will be able to not only change culture and lead culture in another direction, but they will be able to pass it on to future generations.
So Nonviolence 365 or NV365 helps us to manage that in a way that we don't destroy each other, that we don't diminish each other, or, or denigrate is a word that we often use. But we maintain the integrity and character of who we are as human beings. God made us to think at higher levels. Human beings have an ability to think, and we can think ourselves through situations and not have to do things that are destructive. You don't have to just react every time something happens. You really have the capacity in record time, record speed, to think a solution that has a positive and uplifting outcome. We have that capacity as human beings. Use your mind, elevate your mind to a place where you change the dynamics, you change the environment, you change the direction, and you change the trajectory. We want to give these young people those tools to be positive, nonviolent leaders that will change our world for the better and create what we call just, humane, and peaceful society. say to America is be true to what you said on paper. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read of the freedom of press, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. When I say uh, I was married to the cause, my husband was no longer there, then I could continue them in that cause, and I prayed that God would give me the, the direction for my life to give me the strength to do what it was, and the ability to do what it was that he had called me to do. And I was trying to seek what is it that I'm supposed to do now that Martin is no longer here. And I finally de determined that it was to develop an institution because Martin's message and his meaning uh, was so powerful and his spirit, I felt, needed to be continued. I mean, I know that people's spirit lived on, but I think in a, in a very positive, meaningful way that young people would know that that influence was being continued. And so I felt that my role then was to develop an institution to institutionalize his philosophy, his principles of nonviolence, and his methodology of uh, social change, to reach as many people as I can with the message. People assume we already have everything we need. It's already established. 
um, and it's just not true. We are a 501c3, like every other 501c3 um, in America. Um, most of the 501c3s are living from, you know, donation to donation. And so the King Center is the official living memorial created before there was any other king whatever, before there was a King Memorial, before there was a Martin Luther King Jr. support group, before there was a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And so the mothership needs your support. And then we need people to really think about um, embracing nonviolence, 365, as, as, a, as a lifestyle. My Bible tells me that Good Friday comes before Easter. For the crown we wear there is the cross that we must bear. Let us bear it. Bear it for truth. Bear it for justice. And bear it for peace.